I'm going to begin with a personal note. <coughs> this talk is dedicated to an old friend of mine. I show him here on the, next to the Connecticut River in Hadley, a place you've all seen, I think. <coughs> I believe he and I first met about 1933 in the sandbox in an argument over a toy dump truck. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, best friends for 80 years. But now, the subtitle of the talk was A Story of a Missing Flag, a private in the Massachusetts 54th, and a second lieutenant in the 19th United States Colored Troops. My involvement in, that su in this subject, the black soldiers and the Amherst College officers, it all came about from an accident. Sometimes an accident can lead to interesting discoveries if you take advantage of it. A year and a half ago, on the day before Memorial Day, I happened to walk through West Cemetery, our old cemetery in the center of town, and I saw all the fresh new civil uh, American flags next to the graves of the veterans, and the path that I would take around the periphery of the cemetery it goes right past the gravestone of one of our black Civil War soldiers whom I had already met in the course of writing my book, Charles Finnemore, and I was looking forward to seeing a new flag next to his gravestone, and when I got there, it wasn't there. Now, I, I should say right away, I must say, that that was an accident. It was nothing deliberate like excluding the black soldiers. It was simply, we got so many veterans there and it's really hard for the veterans agent to keep track of which ones are veterans and which wars and who she gets the flag and so on. But, so that was an easy uh, thing to rectify. What do you do? You go to Hastings. Hastings has everything for sale. <laughs> uh, I bought a flag and stuck it in the ground. And then I went to see the veterans agent. Uh, my idea really was to uh, get Charles Finnemore and others on the list for next year, make sure they were regularly had fresh flags. And Steve Connor was the one who had the imagination to say, well, let's make a ceremony out of this. So we did, which turned out to be a nice ceremony. Uh, and that led me on into this subject. I'm gonna start with a number to remember 200,000, that is a number that should be in bold face type in every high school history book. 200,000 black men fought for the Union during the Civil War. And 20 of them came from Amherst. This is a list of, the, of our black Civil War soldiers. It's on the handout. I didn't print apparently quite enough copies. I'm sorry for that. Maybe you can share. I know you can't read it from back there, and I don't expect you to read it anyhow. Um, but we had a significant number of black soldiers from Amherst who fought for the Union during the Civil War. That's an often neglected part of Civil War history and of Amherst history. And that's one of my current research activities. The other is a long forgotten for the most part, I think, almost totally part of Amherst College history. Of course, there were many students and recent alumni of Amherst College who fought for the Union. But what I didn't know was that at least 23 that I found so far became officers or surgeons or chaplains or otherwise were commissioned into black regiments. They were all white. In fact, all of the officers in all of the black regiments with just a couple of individual exceptions were white. That's the way it was. Um, I stumbled onto this in the course of finding out about the black soldiers. And the first Amherst College student that I came across who was an officer in one of these black regiments, I thought, oh, hey, that's interesting. That was probably the only one. But it wasn't the only one. If you do the math, with 200,000 soldiers, Basic unit was a company nominally of 100 men. Uh, you need 
you need a captain for every company, you need a couple of lieutenants, you need some higher ups, majors and colonels, you need some surgeons and chaplains. You're going to need about 9,000 such people in the black regiment. And they couldn't all have gone to Harvard. <laughs> of course, Colonel Shaw did go to Harvard, and as did others. But in fact, Amherst College and Harvard were about the same size at the time. In the 1840s and 50s, Amherst College was the second largest college in New England, second only to Yale. Think about that. Uh, the list of those officers is on the other side of the handout. I'm in the course of finding out more about these guys, doing a lot of Googling and a lot of times at Jones Library, in particular at the Amherst College uh, Special Collections Department. Now, rather than tell you everything I know about all those soldiers and all those officers, I'm going to pick out two in particular, one of the soldiers and one of the officers, but first, I can't resist showing you this picture of a black Civil War veteran. We don't know who it is. Because of where it came from, I suspect that this is one of the Thompsons. There were five Thompsons from Amherst, uh, four brothers and the son of one of those brothers, five Thompsons who fought for the Union. Two of them died during the war, and Christopher, was one of the survivors and lived in Amherst after the war. And if you look closely, he's wearing the insignia of the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic, the Veterans Organization for the Civil War soldiers. Now, the two men I want to focus on specifically, Charles Finnamore, whose missing flag got me into all this. Charles fought at Fort Wagner. He was wounded the next year. And the other is Christopher Pennell. They were in different units. Christopher Pennell was the second lieutenant in the 19th USCT, United States Colored Troops, who died in action at Petersburg. Now, in the small town of Amherst, around 1860, chances are that Pennell and Finnamore passed each other on the street occasionally. I have no way of knowing that. Charles was, what, 24 years old, roughly, in 1860, and Christopher Pennell was, um, when he was born, 42, I guess. He was about 20. Um, they probably saw each other on the street, and their stories come together in a curious way after the war. Both of their stories are connected, in a way, to the strong house, next to the Jones Library, and as I'm sure most of you know, it's now home to the Amherst Historical Society. And Charles Finnamore's grandmother, Phyllis, was listed in the federal census in 1800, and also in 1790, the first federal census, as, quote, another free person living in the household of Simeon Strong. Whether Phyllis, Charles's grandmother, actually had been a slave of Simeon Strong in 1790 or before, it's really impossible to tell at this point. <coughs> although, Phyllis, although Phyllis was married to Zacchaeus Finnamore about 1800, she's listed in the church records of Amherst, from 1804 as, quote, Phyllis, Mr. Strong's Negro woman. She really should be enlisted, I suppose, as Mrs. Finnamore. Anyhow, Phyllis married Zacchaeus Finnamore. They had a son, Augustus, who married Eunice Davis. And they had a son, Charles, born in 1836. In the census of 1860, Charles was listed as a laborer living in the household of Christopher Thompson, whose picture I may have shown you before, which is probably, they probably lived somewhere in the vicinity of the Unitarian Church, along with several biases and Batemans, and those are familiar Amherst names, and several other Thompsons. <coughs> 
And three of those Thompsons are among those buried in the uh, in Amherst West Cemetery. In August 62, Charles married Sarah Burkhart of Great Barrington. Mm -hmm. And there's an Amherst connection to W.E.B. Du Bois. The Great Barrington is where du, du Bois was born and, and grew up. And in fact, the B in W.E.B. Du Bois stands for Burkhart. So we have our genealogical connection to two boys. Now, the Finnemore's daughter, Hattie, was born January 1st, 1863, the day that Lincoln signed the Emancipation Proclamation. Um, and you can do the math on those dates if you <laughs> care to. Uh, uh, just two months after Hattie was born, in early March <coughs> 63, Charles joined the Massachusetts 54th. This is a recruiting poster for the Mass 54th, now in camp at Reedville. Reedville is now some part of Boston, I'm not sure where. Uh, and you might notice that they promised pay of $13 a month which turned out not to be true. They were actually paid something like $7 a month. That was an injustice caused by a mistake on the part of Congress, which wasn't corrected until fairly late in the Civil War. <clears throat> Here's a picture of a few soldiers from the Mass 54th. We have a couple of soldiers from the Peter Brace Brigade, is that? the correct name, guys. Um, Massachusetts 54th reenactors here today. After a couple of months of training, the Mass 54th shipped off to South Carolina. <laughs> and that's where Finnemore fought in the famous attack on Fort Wagner on July, I think, 18th, 1863. 150th anniversary of that one coming up next summer. Um, that was a Union loss officially, but that was a battle that did an enormous amount to convince white Americans, Northerners and Southerners, that black men were willing to fight for freedom. The next winter in Florida, at the Battle of Alusty, Charles was wounded in the right leg. That's a battle, it's not like Gettysburg or Chancellorsville or Vicksburg, all the battles you've heard of. Uh, but it was a serious battle, and Charles was wounded in the right leg, but he did survive the war and came back to Amherst. I'll tell you more about that leg wound later on. <laughs> you remember Hattie was born January 1st, 63. Two months later, Charles went off to war. He probably never saw Hattie again, because in April 1864, while Charles was in South Carolina or Florida, Hattie died of smallpox in the Amherst Pest House. Mm -hmm. Charles came back from the war. The Finnemores had a daughter, a son, Charlie, born in 1871, who died a year later. That's Charlie's gravestone, also in West Cemetery, which is broken. Yeah. It really should be fixed. It's lying on its side. Um, but he's very near his, um, near his parents. The daughter, Anna, was born in 1877, who died in 1878, oh. a year and a half later. The Finnemores had no more children, as far as I know. Charlie and Anna are buried in West Cemetery. Where was Hattie buried? I have no idea. Since she died of smallpox, they may have, the authorities may not have been eager to cart <coughs> her small body into town and put it in the West Cemetery. I have no idea. In the late 
hundred, Charles and Sarah lived on Baker Street and on Hazel Avenue. That's an area off to your left as you go down Hamp Road towards Stop and Shop. It's an area where many black families lived then and later. And like all of black veterans in Amherst, who lived in Amherst after the Civil War, Charles was a duly indoctrinated member of the local post of the GAR, the Grand Army of the Republic. Um, there's some towns in the north where the GAR posts, as the local organizations were called, were segregated by race, but at least we got that one right in, in Amherst. I'll come, by the way, how do I know these things about the GAR? Because Jones Library has a wonderful, they have all the collections of the record books of the GAR. Every time they had a meeting, they wrote down who was there and who was in arrears on their duties and everything else. <laughs> Just go to, you want something, you want to find out something, go to Jones Library and ask Tevis and Kate, or go to Amherst College and ask Mike Kelly and his workers there. Well, there's the complete Finnamore family tree. I'll tell you more about Charles Finnamore's post-war life later on, but let me switch to uh, Christopher Pennell. Pennell was the son of a West Stockbridge minister. He went to school at Williston. He entered Amherst College in 1859. And, put in a plug again for Frost Library at Frost, in the Special Collections Department, we have a great collection of letters that Christopher wrote to his Amherst girlfriend. Unfortunately, we do not have any of the letters sent to Pennell when he was in the Army. But immediately after Fort Sumter in, what, April 12, 1861, Fort Sumter was fired on, there was great enthusiasm at Amherst College for joining the Union Army. And Christopher asked his parents permission to <coughs> enlist. This is only nine days after Fort Sumter, where he asked permission to enlist. Permission was apparently denied. Um, and also, although some Amherst soldiers, Amherst students went off to war at that point, some of the enthusiasm for uh, actually fighting diminished. But actually, Christopher's did not. This is my transcription from one of the letters that we have uh, at Frost. A week later, asking permission again, it's clear from the context of this letter, we don't have the letter that his father wrote him, but it's clear from this and other context of the letter that what his father was saying is, let the Irish guys do it. And Christopher Pennell is objecting to this sentiment that the Irish lives were not as valuable. And this is a letter that he wrote to his mother just a couple of days after that one. Uh, it's very clear that Christopher understood very well what the Civil War was about. It wasn't about states' rights. It wasn't about tariffs or whatever. It was about slavery. And Christopher understood that. And so, by the way, did President Lincoln. Now, a year later, July 62, Christopher was now 20 years old. <coughs> he enlisted in the Army. Did he get his parents' permission then? I don't know. Maybe. <coughs> Maybe he just did it. He enlisted in the Mass 34th, not 54th, sorry. Mass 34th was a white regiment. And he was in some fairly minor skirmishes in the Shenandoah Valley. And after a year and a half, he wrote his parents that he wanted to see more action, which he got. When he became a second lieutenant in the 19th US Colored Troops, which was composed of escaped slaves from the Eastern Shore region of Maryland. <coughs> And that regiment was probably mostly in the rear of the battles of the wilderness in Spotsylvania in the spring of 64, but they were in the thick of the fighting at the siege of Petersburg by mid-June of 64. 
<laughs> now, during his three years at Amherst, Christopher had had at least the beginnings of a romance with Saber Snell. <laughs> Saber was 17 when Christopher joined the army. Her father was an Amherst professor, Ebenezer Snell, whose grandfather, by the way, had been a slave owner in Cummington in the 1700s. <laughs> That's Ebenezer Snell. And this is where the Snells lived. This house exists still. Almost all of you have probably passed it many times. Many of you passed it today, I know. It's at the corner appropriately of Snell Street, just the other side of the railroad track or what the one that's around the bike path. And how, how serious the romance was from Saber's point of view is hard to tell, but Pennell was clearly lonely in Virginia he became convinced that he and Saber were deeply in love. And while he was, when he was on leave in Amherst in the spring of 63, he asked permission from Mr. and Mrs. Snell to correspond with Saber. Permission was denied. <laughs> no, Mrs. Snell said, you must be patient. If you wait a year, for a test of your love, and then bring the subject up again, and we'll think about it. <laughs> so for the next year, there was no correspondence between Christopher and Sabra. However, halfway through the year, <coughs> in a letter to Mrs. Snell, Christopher did manage to sneak in a word to Sabra. First, he talks about the Negroes are fast becoming perfect soldiers. Um, but then, please remember me kindly to Professor Snell and to your daughters, plural, all of whom I hope are well. Hi, <laughs> son. Uh, along with that letter, he sent Mrs. Snell a Confederate $1 bill, which we have at Frost Library. We have everything there. So then, we have some amazing things at Frost Library. Mike Kelly recently came across some correspondence from Civil War times when somebody was planning to donate to the college library the skeleton of a rebel horse. <laughs> this is intriguing. Did, this, did the skeleton ever come to Amherst? If so, what did they file it on? <laughs> But then, in June 64, I think a year to the day after Mrs. Snell had said, you got to wait a year, he wrote to Mrs. Snell again, just a year ago today, and I have kept my promise, Madam, I have to assure you that I love your daughter. And then he enclosed a note to Sabra saying, if you're willing, please give this note to your daughter. And that was the beginning of a brief correspondence between Christopher Pennell and Sabra Snell. Oh, I'm sorry, this is the letter from Christopher to Sabra. I declare to you that I love you, and uh, life is short and cheap in these times. Mm -hmm. Then for the next month, he got a letter or two from Sabra, but they weren't as clear as he had hoped they would be. And he didn't, there weren't as many of them as he hoped there would be. I expected to hear from you today, but it wasn't there. I wait as patiently as possible, and I'm sure it has been lost. I saw a white envelope with ELL on the end, but it was for somebody else, Captain Burnell. Are you unwell? I can sympathize with that. When I was 14, at the end of ninth grade, I had a summer job in Woods Hole. The girl in my class, who I fondly imagined was my girlfriend, was somewhere else. She got letters from me, but I didn't get very many from her. <laughs> and I looked in the post office box, and nothing was there. 
And I was convinced that the nasty postmaster knew how I felt and was satisfied. <laughs> the letters were not misaddressed. They weren't lost. The only problem was she was not as interested in me as I was in her. However, I got over it. <laughs> but I do remember looking for those letters. Um, so, finally, July 26th, he's obviously gotten a satisfactory response from Sabra. Now, when we look at this, we know he's going to die four days later. He put numbers on his letters to Sabra. We have some of the envelopes. You can see this is postmarked in Washington, addressed to Ms. Sabra C. Snell in Amherst, Massachusetts. In that same letter that I showed you an excerpt from a minute ago, this is kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> the Land Grant Act was passed in early 1863, and it had been decided recently that what was to become Mass Aggie was to be, was to be in Amherst. And you can see, you know, to think of strolling along the walks through the sacred groves, listening to a discussion of the latest improvement in Suffolk Hawks. Uh, that was the beginning of a long, unfortunate tradition of Amherst College people making snotty remarks about the <laughs> It has not entirely gone away. <laughs> uh, Now that correspondence between Charles and Sabra ended very soon after began with Pennell's death on the 30th of July, leading a charge of his black troops at the Battle of the Crater, sometimes called the Mine Fight, at Petersburg. And among the letters that we have from Christopher to Sabra, we have one written three days later, the night before he was killed, a long letter ending up this way. Meanwhile, we are to have a brigade dress parade tonight, four regiments, and I stop writing, put on my sash. I don't get it. He knew that this explosion was going to take place under the Confederate lines <coughs> early the next morning. There was going to be a big battle. He wasn't going to go to a dress parade. He was going off to get his troops lined up to go into battle. Why did he write that? I, I, I don't understand. Anyhow, that, he didn't get to mail that letter. His commanding officer found the letter in his tent. And I'll show you in a minute. Sent it to Sabra Snell. His body was never found. <coughs> Sauber's letters to Christopher were probably lost in the mud at Petersburg. My friends at Frost Library and I have dreams that they're turning up somewhere. Um, maybe, maybe he was carrying them next to his heart when he went into battle. I don't know. We do have one of the envelopes that those letters came to Pinnell in. You can see it's Postmark Amherst, three cents, to second Lieutenant Christopher Pinnell, and then the address 19th U.S. Colored Infantry, AADC, 3rd Brigade, 4th Division, 9th Army Corps, I think. Um, it all went first to Washington, D.C. Now, as I said, that battle was begun by the Union's exploding, and it was four tons of gunpowder under the Confederate lines at the end of a long tunnel that they had spent a month or so digging. Um, incidentally, the Civil War is, one way the Civil War is interesting, there were a lot of letters written by the soldiers and to the soldiers. A lot of them have survived, and there, were, and there was pretty good postal service, and there was no censorship. His letters to Pinnell, her, his, sorry, his letters to Sabra earlier mentioned this mining, this digging under the Confederate lines. Uh, 
You wouldn't get away with that in World War II, mentioning these military operations that would be wiped out by the censors. But lots of details about where we're going next and who's joining our brigade and so on. Um, anyhow, the, uh, this explosion was supposed to blow a hole in the Confederate lines. Our troops were supposed to surge through the opening. Confederates were going to be totally <clears throat> demoralized. We we're going to capture Petersburg and Richmond along the way and end the war in the summer of 64. The attack failed. The war went on, as you know, until April 65, another nine months or so. It was a terrible defeat for the Union. U.S. Grant, overall commander, of course, described it this way. There were some foul-ups in the execution of the plan. For instance, one of the Union generals, not U.S. Grant, spent the day drinking a bottle of rum in his tent instead of feeding his troops. Details like that. Um, thousands of men died, a great many of them black soldiers, many black soldiers that were shot down after they had surrendered. Some were simply executed as they were being led back through Confederate lines as prisoners. Yes. And this is Cornell's commanding officer, who happened also to be an Amherst College graduate, describing Pennell's death and ending up, <clears throat> he probably sleeps among the unknown, whom we buried in the long deep trenches we dug that day. They taught him grammar in those days. <laughs> But in the home there where it belongs. <clears throat> and then this is the note that Colonel Thomas wrote to Sabra in closing that letter, the one that ended up with saying, I'm going to put on my sash now and go to the parade. Uh, you see that his last thoughts were. Um, <clears throat> this is part of Christopher's service record, and this is the last piece of it blown up. Killed July 30th, 1864, at the mine fight near Petersburg. Pennell was from Amherst College, but his home was in West Stockbridge. So I was surprised to find that he had an obituary in the local Amherst paper, the Hampshire Franklin Express. <clears throat> One of the amazing things about that was I had no idea whether the, his obituary, would, whether his death would even be mentioned, let alone a write-up. And almost all of the portions of the microfilm of the Hampshire Franklin Express are basically dark black and illegible. But two weeks after two weeks after his death, an obituary did appear in the Hampshire Franklin Express and it was in a part of the microfilm that you can actually read. You know. <laughs> and he he thought that the success of the Negro troops would depend very much on the conduct of their officers and he was an earnest Christian as well as a brave soldier. I want to go back to the story of Charles Finnamore after the war. In 1875, Charles Finnamore applied for a pension. I recently got my hands on his 64-page pension file, from which I've learned a number of things. <clears throat> By the way, Sanford Jackson was another Amherst soldier who was fatally wounded in the attack on Fort Wagner. Jackson, by the way, had at one time been married to Angeline Palmer, and aficionados in Amherst Town history know about the story of Angeline Palmer, I, so I won't tell it to you. But you might think that since Sanford Jackson was killed, there wouldn't be a pension file, let alone one that's 175 pages long. I'll save that story for another time. Now, about Finnamore. When I first read about his being wounded in the leg at a lusty, I thought, oh, just a leg wound. Well, lucky him. A little mercure chrome and a band-aid. Well, no. Basically crippled him for life. About six times, at least, during the next few years, he applied for an increase in his pension as a result of disability and presumably and was examined by a surgeon. Presumably, it cost him money for every surgeon examination. Um, it's clear from reading this 
that it was a serious wound, an open sinus from which there is a continuous discharge of bloody pus and so on. The surgeon says, I think the disability entitles him to $8 a month. And the surgeon's reports come with sketches showing in his right leg where the bullet went in and where it came out and where the open sinus is. That extra $3 a month meant a lot to Charles. Went to a lot of trouble. He finally got an increase in the pension. Another thing that I, oh, this is one declaration for an increase in pension. Another thing that I found out about Charles Finnamore was that apparently he couldn't write his own name. <coughs> Every one of these applications, it's signed with somebody else oops, writing his name and then Charles Finnamore with his mark with an X in between. Now, I had blindly assumed that in Amherst, all of the black kids, all the kids went to school in the 1840s and 50s, but it looks as though Finnamore was not one of those who went to school. Some, someday we'll find Wendy Kohler, maybe we'll help him find the, uh, where's Wendy? Find the school attendance reports and we can find out whether Charles Finnamore went to, the, went to grade school, I don't know. This is the only known photograph of Charles Finnamore. 30 years after the war at a Memorial Day celebration in a long line of GAR members, except that I, I like to think that maybe Charles is in this picture. <clears throat> this is a, a dedication of the wonderful St. Gaudens Memorial to the Mass 54th in Boston, and all the veterans of the Mass 54th and the Mass 55th <clears throat> and the Mass 5th Cavalry all black regiments were invited to uh, join the parade. I've tried to find whether there might still be a list somewhere of those veterans who actually came, but I have had no luck at that. But I can't resist showing you a little bit of the detail from that wonderful statue. Now let me switch back to Sabra Snell. Sabra never married. She graduated from Mount Holyoke in 1866. She taught at a private school in Amherst. She worked as a librarian at Amherst College <coughs> and as a curator for the Amherst Historical Society. There's another connection back to the Strong House. That's where Charles Finnemore's grandmother had lived as Simeon Strong's Negro woman. Now, almost all the professors and their families at Amherst College belong to the Church of Christ at Amherst College. <coughs> Maybe it was required of professors, I don't know. <laughs> and in 1869, the Church of Christ at Amherst College raised money for the construction of this building, Zion Chapel, at the corner of Hamp Road and Woodside Avenue. You know. Amherst architecture, there's the Amherst President's House back there. Quote, so that the colored people of the town may have a place to worship. On that site now is Amherst College's Newport Dormitory. And why that dormitory is named after descendants of a man who was born in Africa, captured as a child, and spent his entire life after that as a slave in Hatfield. That's another interesting story that I will skip, but you could buy my book, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, like her parents, Sabra belonged to the Church of Christ at Amherst College. The Church of Christ took responsibility, financial, and control, too, of Zion Chapel. Charles Finnamore attended that church. Sabra Snell was on the Zion Chapel committee, and surely, Sabra and Charles had some dealings. Uh, so that's another way that the Pennell and Finnamore stories come together. And then in 1907, <coughs> when the members of Zion Chapel 
got tired of being preached at by white Amherst College professors, which is something I can sort of understand. <laughs> <laughs> they seceded and formed their own church and formed what became Hope Congregational Church, now it's Hope Community Church, of which Charles Finnamore was a founding member. And that is the church, as I'm sure most of you know, on Gaylord Street, that still exists. Charles died in 1910. The records books of the GAR say Comrade Finnamore died, funeral of Hope Church. There was an obituary for Charles in the Amherst paper next week describing his service with the Mass 54. And he was buried in West Cemetery, where his flag now has a flag, like all the other vets, like this, with an appropriate, this is a GAR marker that goes on the, with the flags of all the Civil War vets, if we remember to put them. Uh, sometimes they get stuck, I didn't steal that one. That <laughs> was given to me as a souvenir for that ceremony we had last year. Uh, and they're made out of plastic now, so they're not so likely to get stolen the way they were a few years ago. Sabra died in 1932, an obituary from the Amherst paper, which I point out in particular, she was a member of the Amherst Historical Society. And there are still some slots open, I think, for those of you who wish to join. <laughs> Just ask the distinguished president. She was buried in the Snell family plot in West Cemetery, right near the gravestones of for instance, David Parsons, our town's first minister who was a slave owner here in the 1700s, of Simeon Strong at the Strong House, of Zephaniah Swift Moore, our first president of Amherst College, distinguished crowd up on top of that hill. This is the Snell's family stone, surrounded by little stones for all the individuals. That's a small one marked for Sabra Clark Snell, 1845 to 1932. Now, curiously enough, Charles and Sabra are buried only 70 feet apart. From This is Sabra's stone on top of the hill. You can look down the hill across this little dirt road to the black section, I'll get back to that in a minute, and that's the gravestone of Charles Finnamore. I say black section, I do not believe it was ever a rule, but it became a custom that this section, you can see little dirt road there, this section on the other side <coughs> was where <coughs> many black citizens of Amherst have been buried. In fact, this veteran's grave over here, that's not Charles Finnamore, that's Randolph Tucker, who's I think a World War II veteran, who was buried there only two years ago. One more thing. We have the note that Christopher gave to his chaplain <coughs> the night before he died. His chaplain also was an Amherst College graduate. As I said, there were 23 guys in, from Amherst who were officers or surgeons or whatever in the uh, chaplains in the Black Regiment. <coughs> Three of them happened to be in the same one. I <coughs> accident. But he gave this note to his <coughs> chaplain the night before he was killed, saying, if I shall be killed, I wish the news to be sent to my father, and second, to a particular classmate, and to my old teacher, Professor E.S. Snell. If I were going in the battle and sent that, would I ask that a note be sent to one of my teachers, or one of my students, for that matter, was going in the battle? Would they ask me to be one of three people to be notified? I don't know. Uh, now, who was my old professor Snell? First of all, he wasn't that old. Um, you can do the math. He was 63 when Snell was killed. He wasn't old. <laughs> Any, anyhow. He graduated from Amherst at the first possible moment in the class of 1822. That was the first year we had any students at all. He was one of the three graduating students. 
He had actually gone to school at Williams first, but he followed the Williams president down here out of the boondocks to <laughs> Metropolis of Amherst when the Williams president became president of Amherst. Graduated from Amherst College, professor of natural philosophy, which was what physics was called then, for basically his whole life. Curiously enough, just like me. <laughs> <laughs> but this talk is not about Ebenezer Snell or me. It's about Charles Finnamore and Christopher Pennell and Charles Finnamore's gravestone. So I think that's a good place to end this. Thank you.